Would you gather your Bibles, please, your different versions, and turn in the New Testament to the book of Acts. We are on chapter 9 of the book of Acts, and we're having a great time trying to understand what uh, is going on as far as Jesus has been cru crucified. He's gone back to heaven. His disciples have had the Holy Spirit come down upon their heads, as you know, in the upper room. And then we hear about one of the deacons, Philip, who was led by the Spirit to talk to a certain Ethiopian eunuch in his chariot. And I'm going to ask John Brent to tell us the rest of the story. On my right is... Gerald Winslow from Loma Linda University Medical Center. John Jones, School of Religion, La Sierra University. John Brunt, the Azure Hills Church. Richard Rice, Loma Linda University School of Religion. And my name is Carolyn Thompson. And John, would you take over, please, beginning with chapter 9, verse 1. Well, let me just say a word about what we have just seen in chapter okay. 8. We saw the story of Philip mm -hmm. and the Ethiopian eunuch. Mm -hmm. It was the Holy Spirit that put the two of them together. That's right. The Ethiopian eunuch had been in Jerusalem worshiping. He was mm -hmm. now on his way home. He was reading a scroll that he had gotten of the book of Isaiah. And since they read out loud, Philip goes up and he hears what he's reading. And he asks the man if he understands. He says, how can I? There's nobody to tell me uh, oh, what it's all about. Yeah. So Philip gets up and explains to him the story of Jesus from beginning with Isaiah 53. And uh, the man, when they come to a body of water, says, well, what would keep me from being baptized? And they stop and go down into the water and the man is baptized. And after that, Philip is taken away by the Spirit. Mm -hmm. The man doesn't see him again, but the man goes on his Rejoice. way rejoicing. Yes. yes, I love that part. Yes. He went and on rejoicing. rejoicing. Yeah. And now we come to a new story okay. in 9. That is the story of the conversion of Saul, whom we already heard about mm -hmm. a chapter ago, just a little over a chapter ago, when... Stephen was stoned, yes. and when Stephen was killed, the first Christian martyr, Saul, who had been persecuting Christians, was there. And he kind of watched over their coats and so forth while they carried out this horrible, uh, thing. this horrible thing. And now we're going to find that he's out on another excursion to persecute Christians. But some amazing things happened. So we start reading in Acts chapter 9, verse 1. Okay. Meanwhile, Saul was still breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. Terrible. He went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues in Damascus. Now that's a ways away up in Syria. I mean, just a minute. What's the difference between the temple and synagogues? Okay, the temple is in one place. That's in Jerusalem. Okay. And sacrifice takes place at the temple. That's okay. where they slaughter the lambs okay. and so forth at the feasts. Mm -hmm. The synagogues are scattered all over. Oh, There's all no right. sacrifice at the synagogues. At the synagogues, they come to study the law. They come and have a worship service where they pray and read the, the scripture. Um, kind of the precursor to our Christian worship services. Okay. Right. But synagogues are all over the place. Okay. So they're up in Damascus in Syria. Okay. So he wants to take, uh, take them as prisoners to Jerusalem. If he finds people in the synagogues who uh, have been infected with this new teaching that okay. Jesus is the Messiah. As he neared Damascus on his journey, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him he fell to the ground and heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? Saul asked. I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting, he replied. Now get up and go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. The men traveling with Saul stood there speechless. They heard the sound, but did not see anyone. Saul got up from the ground but when he opened his eyes, he could see nothing. So they led him by the hand into Damascus. Wow. That, is, that light was really bright. It, it just affected his eyesight. And um, do you think that uh, 
he had any, did Saul have any idea about the teaching of Christianity or their belief in a Messiah or anything, do you think? Or, or, or going back uh, a few verses where it talks about the way. Did you see that in there? Yes, mm -hmm. for yeah, the first time, two. actually. Yes. Nine, two. Uh, mm -hmm. You want to read that again? Where he said? Yes, in, in uh, verse 2. Verse two okay. He went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues in Damascus, so that if he found any there who belonged to the way, yeah, what whether is men the way? or women, he might take them prisoners. Yeah. The way is, is simply the word literally for road. Uh, but Was it, I thought it might be a club or a group of people well, or something. It, it just means the road, but the first name apparently that Christians used mm -hmm. for themselves was followers of the way. They were the people okay, so who they followed had a name. Jesus on the road. Okay. Um, what is it, like a movement or something like that? Mm -hmm. so, mm -hmm. I now, think so. <laughs> is it the case that these were, you mentioned these were Jews in the synagogue, so it looks like what Paul is concerned about is primarily Jews who have accepted Jews Jesus. Jews who have accepted Jesus. And, and now, what would have been the basis of that opposition? <laughs> well, obviously Paul sees it as a threat okay. to the tradition of Judaism that he espouses, mm -hmm. which is, uh, he's a Pharisee. And, um, you know, we don't have a lot of detail on why he considered it such a threat. But mm -hmm. obviously it was, uh, for him, something that would go against the traditions mm -hmm. and this newfangled stuff was somehow yeah. going to, he believed, lead them away from God. Okay. Yeah, there were a lot of angles, some of which were in common with other sects of Judaism. But the one real sore thumb that sticks out, I think, is the notion of somehow blurring the line between humanity and divinity. I think that one really got under their skin. So it was the claims they were making for yeah. Jesus. Is that Already the, it's um, beginning to is, creep in the, the notion that Christ has something of divinity about him and that pushed their buttons. Mm. Mm. And of course also the kind of thing we talked about last time with the different understanding of what Messiah yeah. really was, that they had a kind of expectation Paul would have been looking for a Messiah. What does the word Messiah and, mean? It simply means the anointed one. Oh, um, and it's the same word. It's Christ in the in the Greek and Messiah in the Hebrew. Okay. And this was not the kind of Messiah that they expected. And I think mm -hmm. that Paul probably saw that as a threat as well. He's looking for a Messiah who's going to do one thing, and this Messiah has been yes very different. Okay. Cursed by being crucified. Yeah. Now. Chapter 9, verse 5, I'm going to start reading there. Who are you, Lord? Saul asked. I'm Jesus, whom you are persecuting, he replied. Now get up and go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. The men traveling with Saul stood there speechless. They heard the sound, but did not see anyone. Saul got up from the ground, but when he opened his eyes, he could see nothing. So they led him by the hand into Damascus. For three days he was blind, and he did not eat or drink anything. In Damascus there was a disciple named Ananias. Mm -hmm. The Lord called to him in a vision, Ananias. Yes, Lord, he answered. The Lord told him, go to the house of Judas on Straight street. Mm -hmm. Now, how many of you have been in the, over there and saw the, the street straight? It's mm -hmm. still there. No, really? It showed when we in were the there with Elder okay. Richards. Yeah. Wow. The street straight. Okay, the Lord told him, go to the house of Judas on Straight Street and ask for a man from Tarsus named Saul, for he is praying. In a vision, he has seen a man named Ananias come and place his hands on him to restore his sight. Lord, Ananias answered, I have heard as if the Lord didn't know all of this. Yeah. <laughs> Lord, Ananias answered, I have heard many reports about this man and all the harm he has done to your saints in Jerusalem. And he has come here with authority from the chief priests to arrest all who call on your name. But the Lord said to Ananias, did he give him a big explanation? No, he didn't. He said, go. 
This man is my chosen instrument to carry my name before the Gentiles and their kings and before the people of Israel. I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. Now that's just amazing. Ananias, as if the Lord doesn't know this. Now, mm -hmm. Lord, don't you know this? This fellow Saul, he's hauling people out, mm -hmm. men and women, ties them all up and takes them in the crew. It's terrible what he's doing. Are you sure you have the right man? Mm -hmm. and the Lord mm -hmm. doesn't say, just says go. Mm -hmm. This uh, doesn't give him a great explanation, yeah. does he? Mm -hmm. No. This uh, experience of Saul on the Damascus Road is a uh, classic yeah. account of conversion yeah. and um, it may be worth our time to explore a little of that because it may or may not be the kind of experience that some of our listeners or, or viewers are familiar with from their own experience. So I... You want to talk about that well, a little I, more? Uh, uh, let me put it I this had, way. <laughs> yeah. let, me, let me tell you, who was Saul? He was, he was very brilliant. He was out to do all the Christians in. And I don't think going along in a chariot with Philip there would convert Saul. No, not I in 15 minutes I think the Lord had to knock him yeah. down mm -hmm. to get his attention. Yes. Now. And it's, in, it's interesting the way okay. Paul understands this later on, how... He looks yeah. back on it. Oh, does he? He really, w when you go over to 1 Corinthians yeah. 15, when he talks about the yeah. resurrection, he makes this on a par with Jesus' resurrection appearances mm -hmm. to the disciples Do you after know the, the resurrection. Of that? Let's, yeah, let's First look at Corinthians that. Yeah, 1 Corinthians chapter 15. That, that's a, a very because good... Because <laughs> to be uh, an apostle, you had to be one be of those who, who, who had seen Christ after the resurrection. After the resurrection. Mm -hmm. So, uh, verse 8, verse, verse, mm -hmm. 1 Corinthians 15, 8. Yeah, might, might start reading at verse yeah, 3. Sure. You see, he says, For I, what I received, I passed on to you as a now, this first is Paul. important. This is okay, Paul. Okay, this go is ahead. Paul writing to the Corinthians. Okay. And they have a problem with resurrection in oh. that church. And oh, they he's do. Trying okay. to set them straight. All right. And he says, For what I received, I passed on to you as a first importance that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. And then he starts this list of appearances. And that he appeared to Peter and then to the twelve. After that he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers at the same time, most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep. Now that's something we don't ever hear about in the Gospels, where he that's appeared right. to over 500. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles, and last of all, he appeared to me also mm. as to one abnormally born. Oh. And that, that's a word that can be used either for a premature or a postmature birth. Yes. It's a birth that doesn't happen at the right time. So he says his appearance of the resurrected Jesus wasn't in the same time schedule as the others, but I it's think, nevertheless. I think I just had an epiphany. <laughs> okay. Go, go back to chapter 9 and read verse uh, 7, uh, John Jones. Yes, well... Um, the men traveling Yeah, this is the New Revised Standard now. Okay. The men who were traveling with him stood <laughs> speechless because they heard the voice, but they saw no one. Okay. Yeah. And so Paul then got up from the ground, and, and though his eyes were open, he could see nothing. So they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus, and for three days he was without sight and neither ate nor drank. What about Jesus? Well, Jesus had a 40-day uh, period. No, no, no. I'm talking <laughs> without about... Without eating and drinking, but... No, I'm talking yes, about... Yes, I understand. ...when he was uh, crucified sure, and raised. Yes. And uh, I just never thought of it before, but it could be something. When you yeah. mentioned that Saul kind of... Uh, Paul thought he had kind of an experience like Jesus. Well, he needed that because... Uh, <clears throat> seeing Jesus in his resurrected form was a qualification to be an apostle. Mm -hmm. 
And Paul was always self-conscious about his yeah. apostolic qualifications oh, because there yeah. were there were people who evidently uh, sought to Criticized raise questions him. about mm -hmm. them and say, "Well, yeah. you know, Paul has you his way, but we're not really sure." Was, so Paul yeah. is is establishing a, his apostolic credentials here. That's right. And it's interesting what he says here. If we can just go on, mm -hmm. uh, he says, "I'm the least of the apostles, unfit right. to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the Church of God." Then he goes on, but by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace toward me has not been in vain. On the contrary, I worked harder than any of them. <laughs> oh, <laughs> oh, you uh -huh. yeah. you just so he's sort give of him a little forth, jab you know, there. I got a resurrection appearance, yeah. the least of the apostles, not worthy to be an apostle, but I worked harder than any of them. On the other hand, I can't claim that it was... So he's, he's kind of, he's almost... He, he wants to assert his qualifications, yeah. yet at the same time put him pl himself yes. at the bottom of the list, and yet say, yeah. "But I really belong at the top of the list." Yeah. Well, maybe not. I'm working yeah. harder than they so did. It's sort of, it's. I, I think what you've got looking at at First Corinthians 15, yeah. and then Acts 8 is a very interesting insight into Paul. I mean, this clearly <laughs> was the event that defined his his, his whole now sense Now, did of his uh, mission. But, did uh, uh, Paul ever have a vision of Jesus? Did he ever see him, or did God, Jesus ever appear to him after his conversion? Or well, he was what caught up to the third heaven? Second heaven, yeah. Second Corinthians, yeah. Yeah. Corinthians yeah. talks about that. So then so. he did see him. Hmm? Hmm. Yeah. Well, so they couldn't claim, well, you know, you didn't see God like we did. You didn't see the Messiah before he was slain and all that. Well, I, I think from. My sense is the strategy of Acts of the Apostles mm -hmm. is to, from this point on, place Paul at the center of things. Yes. So his ministry and his approach to Christianity is now getting central play. Mm -hmm. So whereas Peter and then some of the others are the center of the first part of Acts, mm -hmm. Paul narratively, or, or Luke narratively speaking, is making uh, an argument that Paul is just as important to the rise of Christianity as Peter and yeah, all the others. That's yeah. right. In fact, this chapter 9 is the first time we hear the story of Paul's conversion, but we'll hear it two more times. It's three mm -hmm. times in the book of Acts. Isn't chapter that 20, amazing? Yeah, so three, three, three times. times. Yeah, chapter 22 and again 24 in Paul's own words. Here, here Luke is speaking in his own voice. But clearly Luke wants to really push this, doesn't he? As a, as part well, of if you think mm -hmm. of three is the number of finality in yeah. the Semitic yeah. mind, yeah. and so yeah. if, if you Semitic, say it three what do you times, mean? well, I mean the Middle Eastern um, oh. Jews, Arabs, and so mm -hmm. on. I mean, you mm -hmm. you know, you you do something three times. You yes. re so Peter denies Jesus three times. It's, yeah. it's a, it yeah. has a note yeah. of finality to it, and I'm just thinking yeah. if if he tells the story three times, it, he really wants the message That's to right. get across. That's right. And I, would that have had an you know people hearing this story, uh, hearing it three times, it would have had. Well, yeah. did he tell it in different places? They didn't exactly have television. <laughs> Did he, <laughs> was he talking to a different group of people when he well, it's recited? Well, the three same book. Settings here. Yeah. 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 But they're three different contexts. Yeah. Okay. But, the, the, right. but I think the point, Carolyn, is that, that, well, it's already been made, I suppose, but Paul becomes very central to the story from now on for Luke. And I don't know, it seems like it fits the rest of the motif of Luke in that the, you overcome this um, bad start mm -hmm. <laughs> with Saul, very bad start. But then he becomes the champion of taking the gospel out to the whole world and, and in fact has to overcome some considerable opposition to that. Yes. Mm -hmm. And that's, that becomes, I mean, if this were a novel, it's not a novel, but if, it, if this were a story, you couldn't make it up. You couldn't make it up, <laughs> no. right. Mm -hmm. And it's the conflict that, much of the conflict that takes place in the rest of it is getting this gospel out there yeah. to, the, to the rest mm -hmm. of the people. Well, and getting people to realize that this is a... What Jesus has started is meant for all people, all people, and that they are supposed to now live together within the same community. Mm -hmm. So that, I think that was the astonishing thing to the early uh, leaders here is that, mm -hmm. my, I mean, look who, who, who's responding to the gospel, people who have been excluded from. I mean, we mentioned uh, last time uh, the Ethiopian eunuch. I mean, he would have been outside the community and now he's brought into the community. Mm -hmm. And so Saul's work eventually of reaching outside the community to those who would have been regarded as is not sort of sent, you know, integral to it yeah. is the most astonishing thing about yeah, Christianity yeah. from yeah. the beginning. Yeah. I have another question. What, why would 
God choose a man like Saul? Mm -hmm. To well, be, oh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> it's like what red meat to this. <laughs> whole books have been written on that. <laughs> uh, yes, there have been many whole books written on that. Question. I mean, really, mm -hmm. look who well, he chose. Somebody, he was very he smart. Was perfect. He was brilliant. Yeah, he was yeah. against him. Well, so. And, he, well, go ahead. Well, I mean, the, the list is amazing. Yeah. He's, he's Jewish. His, his credentials are absolutely pristine as a member of the Jewish community. He's lived in a Roman uh, city. He's a Roman citizen. He understands Roman culture. When you think about the one who is to become the, the major vehicle for launching Christianity <coughs> into the larger world, He's absolutely perfect. You know, all Who the, do all you the say, Jerry? <laughs> all of that, yeah. but I, I think uh, well, I like can invoke a good uh, Jewish word, and that is he had chutzpah. Chutzpah. <laughs> that he had. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know, when when he when you read his letter to the Galatians, and he says of Peter or Cephas, mm -hmm. I condemned him to his face because he deserved it, and I did it publicly. They didn't. You telling me they had a little quarrel there? Uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Okay. Uh, you know that's not that's but not a Christians um, can quarrel. Once well, that's a, a little that's not a little wallflower yeah. wilting yeah. lily or something. He this and is Barnabas remember had a mm -hmm. disagreement and split up. So split I, up. what about yeah. Timothy? We admire Paul, but I'm sh it was kind of uh, yeah. Paul's way or the highway. You know? yeah. In other words, he had proteges and yeah. he had rivals, but not a lot of. What you, would you say? Yeah. Would you say I, he was I, opinionated? I admire him. Yeah. I'm not sure I would like him. Yeah. That's, right. That's the issue. I used to know? ask students uh, to, to write a little essay after reading Acts of whether they'd like to room with him in college. <laughs> <laughs> Most no. of them didn't want to. <laughs> he'd, be a good, no. he'd be good for like a, a Friday night or Saturday night debate or discussion. Mm -hmm. I think living with him would have been a little bit hard. <laughs> His wife may have figured speaker. that out. You'd be glad when he came to town. I wonder on something you said earlier, though. If Paul would have considered what happened on the Damascus Road a conversion. Mm. I, mean, in, we, I, I was no, trying to get at no. the, the question I wanted to no. raise is, as we think of this, yes. a dramatic transition that you can point to and say, that's where I was converted. Um, I think we sometimes think of that as the model for all conversions, mm -hmm. and that raises questions in the minds of people who maybe have, like, let's say, Timothy, the kind of continuous yeah, religious Yeah, grandmother, mother, and you. They don't uh, have Dennis, that sort yeah. of it's parting uh, of the ways mm -hmm. or a fork in the road kind of thing. And I was just sort of going to bring that out and see if anybody wanted to yeah. talk about well, sure. the I mean, styles of conversion that people yeah. have. Well, any, any parent who's raised children in the faith sort of hopes they don't have to go through Paul's experience. Mm -hmm. to, right. I mean, may, they will have to find their way, but you hope they don't have to uh, go out and kill people and so forth. Well, mm -hmm. I, I had a college classmate. You, you will know. He was in my class. I won't mention his name here. Why but not? He, well, <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm just teasing. He had a background in, uh, he had a background of uh, drug addiction and he done time in jail and uh, he had quite a story and then he found the Lord or the yeah. Lord found him and when, when he talked about what the Lord had done for him he could roll up the sleeves of his shirt and you could see needle marks up and down his arms. Well I had grown up in a very conservative religious home, gone primarily to church schools and so on and I couldn't pinpoint yeah. A moment in my experience where I had that kind of dramatic change, mm -hmm. I didn't have a lot of bad stuff to repudiate. No. You know, I've been a pretty good kid. So, so when, when he stood up to talk about what Jesus had done for him, I mean, he had a dramatic story to tell, and uh, I didn't. And we usually, well, a lot of people would use the expression of Damascus Road experience to talk about what, what my classmate Bob, <laughs> if you Ooh. must know his name, had gone through. And, and I didn't. So I think it's useful to reflect on the fact that you can have a dramatic uh, uh, experience with the Lord without necessarily uh, having to depart from everything. Exactly. That's for sure. But again, it's Luke who, who gives us a very different model in the story of those uh, disciples going down from Jerusalem to Emmaus mm -hmm. on Sunday morning, mm -hmm. Sunday after the resurrection. Uh, here, uh, Jesus appears among them unrecognized backs all the way up to Moses and all the prophets, works slowly through, gradually clearing up misunderstandings and prejudices and previous ideas. 
I think that Luke is saying to us there are a variety of pathways mm -hmm. into, yeah, I into agree. the way, you know. Mm -hmm. So we've got mm -hmm. the, the yeah. Damascus Road and the yeah, Emmaus Mayus Road. Road. Yes. Mm -hmm. And then you've got the road to Jericho. Again, that's Luke, isn't it? Because mm -hmm. that's, right. that's the way of rolling Jericho, up your sleeves yeah. and helping people. Mm -hmm. That's another mm -hmm. path. Um, so without preaching sermons, all of that, I think these stories serve to function in the early church to legitimize a variety of Christian experiences mm -hmm. along the way. Mm -hmm. and, and I think another thing about this, uh, it, it's not the model for all kinds of religious experiences. We yeah. say there's a variety. I, I think that for Paul, it would never have been thought of as a conversion from one religion to another. No. It was a commission to be the apostle to the Gentiles. It was a commissioning by, by the risen Jesus. <coughs> But he considered himself a Jew both sure. before and it's after. It's a further step along the same That's path right. in a way for mm -hmm. him. But it, it did involve in it a quite different perspective on Jesus. Absolutely. Was. That, was the yeah. big, Absolutely. that was the big change. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Maybe one of the take home lessons is that whenever God finds a person who is sincere mm -hmm. and in the dark, God doesn't leave them in the dark mm -hmm. for very long. Mm -hmm. That's a good take home lesson. Um, I think the story of Paul is something else because he wasn't perfect. Mm -hmm. He was quite into himself. Mm -hmm. He was brilliant. He knows I fought a good fight. I finished the faith and henceforth is laid up for me a crown. Mm -hmm. Not for me only, but for all those who love his appearing. So he's a wonderful person. He's somebody I want to meet with. If I should be so lucky that I make it into heaven. And I think that our, uh, our uh, scholars have helped us understand a, a lot about Paul that we probably didn't understand before. So we, we would ask our audience to keep with us. We're not through with Paul. We're going to continue on in the book of Acts chapter 9 next time. So if you have the chance, we'd love to have you join us. And now this is Carolyn Thompson for Searching for Answers. <laughs>